Welcome back. One of the big stories in the last part of the year was the caravan of thousands of migrants from Central America who tried to reach the United States. They settled from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, fleeing the violence and poverty in their countries. Telesur's correspondents in the region accompanied them throughout their journey. Since their entry into Mexico until they reached the northern border, members of the Central American Exodus covered a distance of more than 4,000 kilometers. They came from their countries with hope as they escaped the hostile political, social and economic conditions. That changed when they reached the sealed shut borders imposed by U.S. President Donald Trump. To understand a little bit more of this long journey, we've prepared this following report. Mexico's southern border closed for the migrant caravan, so thousands of Central Americans crossed the Suchiate River to get into the country, in spite of the Mexican police's attempts to stop them, which put their lives in danger. We have to find another way of getting into Mexico. Our destination is still a long way ahead. There is no going back. And so began their 4,200-kilometer trek north to the border with the United States. That's where most see their future, but also the source of the problems that force them to leave. The neoliberal policies that Donald Trump is imposing in Central America are producing this migration. They are making our countries poorer, and people have no choice but to flee. Along the way, the migrants face the constant threat of deportation by the Mexican immigration authorities. Look how they're deporting us. Comrades, nobody gets ahead, so they can't pick us off and arrest us. They say that the difficult conditions back home justify the risks. Please hold on tight. Take care. Remember, your lives are the most important thing. God, protect my family from any accident. But it's better than being in Honduras with all the crime in that government. More than 20 million Mexicans live abroad, so the people here are no strangers to migration. That's why many offer their help. I like these people to achieve their dream of getting out of poverty, although it is a big responsibility with all of them on the back. There were some signs of discrimination, but also gestures of solidarity from Mexicans. It's crazy to use tiny incidents to disqualify the struggle of these people. They had good reasons to leave their country. After their long journey, the U.S. border is also close to them, on the orders of Donald Trump. He stepped up security and blocked requests for asylum. Some migrants began a hunger strike to try to speed things up. Political asylum is not a privilege. It's a right in any country. And unfortunately, immigration is holding this up. Stopped in its tracks, the migrant caravan slowly dissolves into Mexican society or crosses the border illegally, as long as their own countries remain mired in poverty and violence. They say there is no way they can think of going back. The march ends at the U.S. border, but hope for thousands of Central Americans continues in their pursuit of a decent life. Two years after the signing of the peace agreement between the government of Colombia and the FARC, the country continues to face many of the same issues it did before 2016. Among these is a wave of murders of community leaders and human rights activists. Over the past two years, Colombia has faced a grave humanitarian situation with the systematic killing of social leaders and human rights activists. This partly reflects the lack of governmental presence in the country's most remote regions, as well as the normalizing of violence. This government has not embraced the peace process. It hasn't recognized it and has rather sought to undo it. This encourages violence by groups who do not care about a solution to the armed conflict. What's worse is that those who suffer this violence are people who have been left to fend for themselves by the government. Indigenous organizations, as well as organizations which are working to substitute illegal crops, have been hit the hardest by the violence. For them, it's clear that these attacks are backed by economic and political interests. 
We are seen as a nuisance, a hindrance to the control of the land. The easiest way to get rid of us and to generate fear is to massacre social leaders throughout the entire country. The departments that have been the most affected so far are Antioquia, Cauca, and Nariño. Since the peace agreement was signed, close to the 500 social leaders and human rights activists have been murdered, a situation that has remained a low priority for the government. As a special reporter, I have visited many countries in conflict, but Colombia is truly a particular dramatic case. To this day, neither the Attorney General's office nor the Defense Ministry have been able to identify those responsible for the murders, despite the fact that these areas are heavily militarized. As a result, social movements have begun their own investigations. 96% of these killings in question were carried out with guns and ammunition that belong to the state, which is highly alarming, and we need to call out the government over these figures. While these crimes are on the rise, Iwan Duque's government continues to stigmatize social leaders and human rights activists, which only makes the situation worse. This, on top of a lack of interest by the government in dismantling right-wing paramilitary groups. When Ivan Duque became president of Colombia in August, many observers said he had two options either follow the political line of his mentor, Alvaro Uribe, or betray him. Yet it seems that Duque chose to stay somewhere in the middle, and now he's at a head of a rudderless government. President Ivan Duque's first few months in office have not been working out as well as he may have hoped. Polls show that he's quickly becoming the most unpopular leader of the past 20 years. Al interior de la Casa de Nariño, un enorme desorden. Inside Nariño Palace, there's great disarray, with no coordination between advisors, which leads them to undermine each other. The cabinet secretary also seems to be doing a poor job of coordinating the government's agenda. The president isn't leading anyone. Inside Nariño, it's a free-for-all. A lack of coordination and control by the president has also damaged the relationship with Congress, where many of his reforms have failed. Iwan Duque's government first buried all important reforms that were meant to fight corruption. Out of 24 projects that people voted for in a referendum to fight corruption, the ruling party managed to torpedo 22 of them. Political reform was shut down as the judicial reform. The only thing that managed to get through was the tax reform, which is only there to destroy the middle class and the poor. On the international stage, this government is dead set on destabilizing Venezuela and putting an end to the administration of Nicolas Maduro, fueling regional tensions. The Colombian Foreign Ministry has inexplicably been against establishing official communication channels with Venezuela, even during the most difficult moments of Venezuelan Colombian relations. Even during the governments of Álvaro Uribe or Juan Manuel Santos, there had always been official channels of communication. An unwillingness to implement the peace agreement with the FARC, as well as continuous attacks by the ruling party against the opposition, have also been characteristics of Duque's government. There is an obvious connection between the lack of action over the peace agreements and the constant attacks against our party's political participation in Congress. On top of that, many of our people remain in jail. Many have argued President Duque has no clear government plan and much less one that addresses the people's needs. Coming up after the break, we look back at one of the turning points in Africa this year, the arrival of a new government in Ethiopia filled with women. Stay with us. Acompañamos a los pueblos que resisten.
en cada una de sus luchas. Somos esa ventana que se abre para visibilizarlos entre fronteras. Thursday, only on Telesur. The life is full of moments. Moments of fight. Moments of hope. Moments that present. Moments that you can live in. Telesur documentaries. Sundays. Only on Telesur. When it comes to involving women in politics on the African continent, Ethiopia made history this year. The country got its first female president, filled half of its cabinet with women, and for the first time appointed a woman to the top role in the Supreme Court. But what does this mean for a country where prejudice against women has deep roots? When Saleh Wuxud was sworn into office as Ethiopia's first female president, the whole world turned its attention to the Horn of Africa and a country with entrenched prejudice against women. The 68-year-old diplomat was elected without competition to replace Malaitu Teshum, who resigned for unclear reasons. Saleh Wuxud previously held the roles of Ethiopia's ambassador to France, the Djibouti, and Senegal. Prior to taking up the presidency, she served as the United Nations top official at the African Union. I, Saleh Wapzode, today when I start my work as Ethiopian Federal Democratic President, I vow to fulfill my duties faithfully. Although her role is mainly ceremonial, many saw Saleh Work's appointment as a historic step towards erasing gender-based inequality in Ethiopia and the inclusion of women in high-level decision-making positions. In the coming 12 years in which she is expected to serve as president, Sally Work has promised to bring change for women in the country. The main victims are women. So during my presidency, my main focus is to ensure peace by mobilizing all Ethiopian women's peace lover men and all peoples of the world who love peace. Saleh Work is the only current serving female head of state in Africa, whilst Namibia has a woman as prime minister. She is not the legal nor constitutional head of state, but rather deputy to the president. However, more and more often, women are becoming leaders of their countries. Five women are running for the Nigerian presidency in 2019, and around the world there are about two dozen women leaders, many of whom took office in the last few years. Progressive changes in Ethiopia aren't limited to Saleh Work. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who actually wields the real power, reduced his cabinet from 28 to 20 members and filled half of the seats with women. This means that after Rwanda, Ethiopia is the second African nation to achieve gender balance in its cabinet, and it is one of only a handful of countries to do so across the globe. Obviously, the presence of these ministers is powerful. You know, for the first time in history, young girls will see 10 women taking oath and being ministers, being known as ministers, and that matters a lot. But that is not the, m the most important part of it. The foundation for that is creating a free and fair environment for everyone to freely participate in politics, because oppressive environments will exclude many people, but that works harder on women because their lives are already complicated and hard. Some positions held by women have significant power within government and in decision-making in general. 
Paesha Mohammed became the first woman defense minister, whilst Muferit Kamil was appointed head of the newly established Ministry of Peace. Women's political participation, to me as well, is beyond a cabinet positions. It's participation at all levels and the participation of women who have never been in politics before. Women as voters, women as candidates, women as uh, members of civil society and opinion makers, women in media. All of this works towards women's, meaningful women's political participation. And in order for that to happen, this cannot be only done by the PM or directly by, through appointments like that. From restricted access to education to forced marriage and sexual harassment, the list of reasons why women aren't involved in politics is long. Only 30% of students at the Addis Ababa University are women, and more than a third of them experience some form of sexual violence at the institution, contributing to higher dropout rates. It is no wonder that so few women enter the traditional male-dominated world of politics. One being the environment is um, designed for men by men, and it doesn't really allow uh, women to function in that in that space. Uh, but also how we raise women, uh, the kind of um, the kind of um, gender roles that we've put in place, uh, we've not a allowed women to dream of that, to think of that, and to be honestly accepted in that space. Um, and also another reason is we've laid uh, more social responsibilities on women. Um, so politics is a very risky uh, business, especially in our country. Critics say the reforms introduced by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed are just a small part of what needs to be done to realize gender equality and solve issues affecting women. Ms. Solomon says women's rights and gender-based violence in particular need to be a national priority. Um, clearly, there needs to be more uh, budgeting towards gender. Um, uh, for, from my understanding, the Ministry of Women um, and Children and Youth is the least funded ministry, um, which kind of shows you how uh, important uh, the ministry is viewed to be. Um, and I think that capacitating that ministry, and I think it's very important to separate it with children and uh, from children and youth, but also capacitating the ministry as it is. Until then, there are several civil initiatives looking to change Ethiopian society's traditional beliefs regarding women. The capital, Addis Ababa, recently hosted a unique exhibition called What She Wore, which challenged the widely held notion that a woman's clothing invites assault. There is also the Yellow Movement at Addis Ababa University, co-founded by Ms. Solomon, which aims not just to tackle gender-based violence, but also serve as a platform to empower women. And with that, we've come to the end of this look back at some of the stories that mark the year. I'm Sweeney Gray. Thank you so much for watching Global Impact 2018.